Dr. Sahu, and in spite of my limitation and the technical problem, Dr. Sahu keeps me obliging and I feel quite embarrassed, often I so embarrassed for the favor which he does and provides me opportunity time and again. I'm really, really overwhelmed with the affection and the love. And what I would now be talking to you about the issues which is related to crisis and often we fail, face this crisis and in last COVID to COVID-1 and COVID-2 both there was problem and many patients coming from different area M most of the time our corporate hospital was closed only government institutions were running and at that time a lot of patients came to us and, and, and we, we had hardly, we were hardly anything to do with them. So what I will talk today, how we can learn the technology and clinical precision, and then we can make uh, some diagnosis. And then these diagnoses would be able to help us. And, and we can do something to our patient sick people. Can I have the next slide, please? This is the sensible medicine balancing intervention and inaction during COVID-19 pandemic. I would be talking the COVID pandemic and then I would be talking to you about the importance of these molecular medicine and how to join these perceptions together. So we have a base of knowledge and translational medicine. We have the new evidences. But then in between, we have a sensible medicine, what we call sensible medicine, which is based on medical nihilism and hawkism. And then we have to deliver to the society. Next slide. This is the post-COVID world. And we are identifying the causal gene, its correlation. We have a base of knowledge. And then there are the phenotypic and genetic heterogeneous evidences. And also we have in between what we call the polyclinic risk and then ultimately our clinical interpretation. Precision leading to perception and then delivering with limitation whatever we can deliver to individual. Next slide, please. This is the publication which starts and this is the era, this is the publication 2021. And this talk about the causative SARS-CoV-2 virus and its relation in diabetic patient and with what we have understood now that those patients who are at a high risk, who are obese, who are have on the multiple drugs are at a very high risk. And this life-threatening symptoms which arise, we have now to translate into the molecular knowledge what we have learned. So I'll go a step further. Next slide, please. This is in relation to the prediction. On one hand, we have a non-diabetic individual. On other hand, we have a diabetic patient. These non-diabetic individuals, we understand now with the knowledge that the virus exploits multiple organs, resulting in beta cell dysfunction, glycemic variability, hepatic manifestation, endothelial dysfunction, decreased diversity, microbiome, increased intestinal permeability, increased stress and depression, and alteration in pancreas, liver, brain access. This is leading to new onset type 1 and type 2. I was listening since this morning. I was trying to understand how far we have gone. Some of us understand that does it lead to type 2. One Dr. Banshi was talking before or it is type 2 diabetes, or it is the deterioration because of the epigenetic factor. On the other hand, we have a diabetic patient with the virus exploitation of multiple organs, severity due to altered SE2 activity, calcium homeostasis, hypercoagulation, problem with the RAS system, dysregulation, and then leading to aggravation of diabetes and its vascular complication poor glycemic control, higher morbidity and mortality. All these grouped together, we have one hand more vulnerable patient. On other side, we have a more susceptible patient. 
can together in a state of immune compromise situation these patient presents to us in different clinical problems now the problem with the corporate hospital is that they have everything and they have a good access to the diagnostic tool as well as the management but there are large population which cannot go to corporate hospital even government institution refuse to take these patient so we'll talk how this small perception can modify the course of treatment next slide please next slide can i have the next slide this is the first publication from our institute so i wanted to bring it here and this is the from banaras can you go to the previous slide please previous slide the previous slide now now the previous slide the one which you skipped the previous two slides the previous two slides can i have yeah this is the publication from banaras hindu university and what next slide please this i have already spoken the next slide this was the publication from banaras hindu university in which what we have tried to show you the association of ac2 gene in relation to type 1 and type 2 both diabetic patient though this has been said time and again time and again this has been discussed and and still what we have learned probably this has no correlation nevertheless one of the important issue with this is that there is increased susceptibility and increased expression of ac2 which is substantially increased in patient with type 1 and type 2 diabetes and therefore in the patient we get such patient where there are problem then these patient and if on the treatment certainly we can do some contribution and we can understand so we understand that ac inhibitor arbs have nothing to do still still there is a chance that some of these patient may be using these drugs and we have yet to understand how these ac inhibitor and the receptor their expression behave next slide can i have the next slide please हेलो डॉक्टर कमला का सर हेलो डॉक्टर कमला का सर हेलो अरे एबल टू सी मी यस सर यस सर अरे एबल टू कैन यू लिसन नाउ यस सर कैन यू लिसन नाउ Yes, sir. I can. Can you listen now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can. So, 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 I'm at the slide. Yeah, this is the histone methyl transferase, and there is now what we understand that there is a differential expression of the methyl transferase set DB2, which is myeloid specific deletion. हेलो सर आर यू एबल टू हियर मी 
हेलो हेलो कमला कर सर हेलो डॉक्टर कमलाकर सर आई थिंक वी लॉस्ट हिम इन कनेक्शन सर वी कैन सी यू कैन यू जस्ट स्पीक आई मीन फ्रॉम वन अदर लैपटॉप यू आर ज्वाइन ऑलरेडी Now can you listen me? Yes, sir. We can listen you. Please continue. I'm, I'm really very sorry. Really no sorry. No problem. No but, issue. But this is the, but this is differential expression of the methyl transferase set DB2, and this is the myeloid specific relation which is impaired has impaired the transition of macrophage from an inflammatory phenotype to reparative in normal wound healing. What I mean, I'm going to the next slide now. That. this particular evidence now has been translated into the clinical manifestation of those patient if you look at right side there is the set db2 gene which has been shown into the vacant and one is with the close bar and what is have shown the culprit appears to be an enzyme and the same enzyme has been implicated in the non healing inflammatory wounds found in people with diabetic what is importance is this that if we have a patient with chronic non healing wound and diabetes it has an association with sars cov 2 virus and there is increased susceptibility of this virus for the bad outcome clinical outcome so perception of having prolonged non healing wound in association with diabetic patient who happen to contract sars cov 2 virus have a high mortality rate we have a different set of clinician at the my extreme left this is what i look like practicing or seeing patient only with the stethoscope and having nothing else than the pen and the paper you have a corporate hospital sir dr trehan and you have a brilliant uh, dr shashank joshi who knows everything and and taking the country ahead and doing lot of help to the government but all these three setting in which patient come to us the primary care setting patient continues to come to us and it is this place where we need some clinical perception in its translation next slide please can i have the next one next one so what happens what leads to the poor outcome in this pandemic is it the beta cell damage at the time of admission and we have a hyperglycemia clinically you can perceive the obesity people who are extreme obese have a high probability of getting it and deteriorating patient having lot of inflammatory condition together either fever or own non healing wound or having trauma having multiple coagulation problem with the coronary artery disease with the stroke previously peripheral artery disease the older age people associated with comorbid condition like blood pressure and kidney disease all these would lead to either at admission hyperglycemia or new onset of diabetes consequences due to beta cell damage or cytokine storm next slide please this was have been talking and and this is what next slide please next slide please this is uh, our very famous dr mohan the celebrity figure international figure from our country and he has been talking these clusters uh, in last one year where, wherever i've heard his lecture he has been talking about these clusters what is the advantage of these clusters and how our perception can change 
And when we do not have anything, we do not have access to the genetic lab, we do not have access to the sophisticated investigation, we can look the phenotype and we could look at the severe autoimmune diabetes. And somebody this morning was talking about the clinical evidences of severe autoimmune, could be hypothyroid, could be hyperthyroid, could have a rheumatoid arthritis, can have ulcerative colitis, a Crohn's disease. All this phenotype patient have a separate group and here we need intervention with insulin. We can have an other extreme, who, patient who have got the severe insulin deficiency and we can look at the phenotype of this cl cluster. We can have patient severe insulin resistance who might uh, require only with the metformin and some oral hypoglycemic drug. And then we have MODI big group of the MODI seven variety. Somebody was talking genetic variation. Uh, Dr. Anjit Unni Krishnan was talking this morning of the 14 different variations. So this clinical perception, what has been added in last one to two years? by these brilliant scientists, clinician, Dr. Mohan, can be translated as a novel subgroup in type two diabetes and we can associate the microvascular outcome, which is uh, inspired Asian study. We have seen this slide time and again. What was important is we understand now if we can pick up these MODI patient and we can look at the, they would be responding to low dose of the sulfonylurea. And also we have the other extreme, who re require insulin, HNF1, BMOD, but there could be glucokinase, hexokinase 1, where treatment is not required. What's important here, to pick up these patients clinically and also to decide what we can do best in our clinical setting. Next slide, please. Next slide, now. Next, hold on. Another very important and one of our older teacher used to talk about is that the general blood picture, which has access to each and every clinician with the help of a pathologist, would also decide about the severity of a COVID. Look at the four different situation. Here, it is the non-diabetic group, which have got monocyte size, which is pro-inflammation because of the inflammation. We have a looking at the monocyte size, and then the second group, which is called lymphopenic. Look, hardly you see any lymphocytes here. And the patient, if he has a male gender, looking at the BMI, looking at the duration of the diabetes, if I got a severe lymphopenia with having CD8 deficiency, they require intensive care and their response will be very, very difficult to manage. And they should be sent directly to the ICOs and we should not interfere with them. On other extreme, we have a monocytopenia. We have a lymphocytopenia. We have a monocytopenia. Type 2 diabetes patient with monocyte size looking at the classical example. And these are the patients are highly susceptible for inflammation and would be responding entirely differently. Then also we have the patient associated with hypertension and they have the associated large monocyte deficiency. Can I have the next slide, please? So looking at the GBP. Simple GBP would decide the severity of COVID. Now I'm coming to the other extreme, the famine, the cognitive impairment to the older people, dementia in diabetes. Can I have the next slide, please? There are two different factors which would add to dementia and we can now add, pick up them. And based on the neurotoxins, inflammation, synaptic dysfunction on one hand, and other based on the oligemia, the vascular damage, the microvascular hypoperfusion, and then raising phospho tau protein with neurodegeneration have a high prediction for synaptic dysfunction, neural and injury, and neurodegeneration. And therefore, dementia is another crisis which would happen during these diseases, especially with the diabetes as well as the uh, associated COVID condition. We now, our patients are surviving longer and because of their surviving longer, the access to the drug is there, but still a larger group have a, these problem of cognition, dementia and comprehension. Next one, this is what would happen that the M2-like vascular repair in presence of the CMB and then leading to the microglial activation in response to vascular injury in normal 
diabetic mice. This is an experimental evidence 2019 publication. What is important here is if we want to prevent dementia and neuronal degeneration early, then we need to intervene. We need to intervene with the class of the drug which are able to prevent the vascular complication. And we have now good drugs. We have been talking since this morning about these new vascular drugs which act on the vascular endothelium, which takes care of the vascular permeability, which takes care of the membrane as well as the podocyte. Next slide, please. How does this occur? The diabetes associated cognitive dysfunction. It occurs because of impaired neurogenesis, BVT dysfunction, inflammation, hypoglycemia, insulin resistance, leading to ischemia, and also acceleration of the dementic pathology, and then there is a cognitive dysfunction. So these elderly people have their own problem in giving the prescription, in compliance, drug compliance, making drugs available, and the large population which comes from the village during the famine, during the crisis, during the natural disaster, do not have access and often tend to forget the medicine and therefore they need our help. This cognitive disorder, next slide please, is also based on microangiopathy, based on hypoglycemia which would add to the insulin resistance can regulate phosphorylation and tau protein and therefore its clearance to amyloid protein can also add to cognitive dysfunction. Then macroangiopathy, both inflammation and a genetic background, all this would add to deterioration of pre-existing cognitive factors and, and patient, and one of the important reasons that you counsel them, you pro provoke them to take insulin, you try to manage them, but still they do not respond and they do not have the attendant. And, and some of most of my patients come and without any attendant and it's very difficult during the time of the crisis to convince them. Next slide, please. These are the two different studies in relation to unspecified dementia, Alzheimer disease and vascular dementia. And what has been now found out that the prospective risk of unspecified dementia, Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia have risk and they have been shown as a function of EPO E43 and E44 genotype compared to the common E33 genotype. And these patients who have this particular genetic and if you pick up them and they have the problem with the high plasma glucose they may not have frank diabetes, but these are the patients who have a high plasma glucose and, and we try to look at them and we, we try to segregate them and look at their genetic profile. We would be able to know this particular group is quite susceptible for dementia and therefore they might need our help. Next slide, please. This is the study I was talking to you. This is relation to the unspecified dementia Alzheimer disease, vascular dementia, and ischemic heart disease. And look at the this forest uh, graph that the all the three, the vascular dementia, the Alzheimer, as well as unspecified dementia, have high observational plasma glucose. So even if they are not diabetic, in the during pathogenesis, these are the patients who are a high at a very high risk. And if we able to pick up them. And we know that you look at the profile, their genetic risk, as well as the profile which has been studied, they have a high predilection to develop diabetes in the future. So we can pick up these patients and we can translate it. Those patients who have got dementia, vascular dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, or they have got unspecified dementia are at a very high risk. And in the older home, and also during the time of disaster, during the time of the catastrophe, they need a special care. Next slide. Looking at some of the drugs, and this is the area which I need all of you to perceive. We have a still very cheaper drug like thiazolin dione, and somebody was talking that we have, the, JJ was talking that some of the drugs we do not look at, and, and they are very important drugs. They have got lung protection. One of the reasons in this COVID 19 patient also is the problem of the 
losing lung volume and losing the lung requiring capacity and getting fibrosis, severe fibrosis over the period, post-COVID period. Thus, the udolidine dione have an advantage of stabilizing ACE2 enzyme, inhibition of ADAM17, inhibition of IL-16, and lung protection. Therefore, this knowledge can be utilized and simple these oral drugs can be prescribed to prevent the lung fibrosis and protect the lung also. Next slide, please. How does TGDs work? They work through on-memory cognition. They improve spatial memory. They work, improve on AB clearance. They decrease neuroinflammatory cytokine. They also work on tau phosphorylation. They also decrease kinase activity. They also work on the astrocyte, and therefore they decrease the inflammation and phagocytic response. They also work on the mitochondria, and they decrease mitochondria oxidative stress, improves the activity as well as anti, improves the mitochondrial biogenesis. So this old drug, which is uh, often we do not use it, is, is a drug which can be used very safely, very cheap drug, and can be used to prevent dementia, cognitive impairment, vascular dementia in the patient who are suffering with either COVID during time of crisis or during the follow-up. Next slide, please. The last few disaster outcome, the famine. And we understand now the environmental pressure on the famine, which altered the whole metabolic milieu and lead to epigenetic modification to the genome expression. There are fet fetal physiological altered phenotype and also related to the mitochondrial and nutritional environment as well as the high risk for developing diabetes. This 1944-1945 Dutch famine, which has led to impaired glucose tolerance. So, so this is important because we still have during these crises, during the pandemics or during the tsunamis, we have a large population who do not have access to the food and famine can induce impaired glucose tolerance, can also expose the famine to early gestation leading to atherogenic lipid profile, higher BMI, increases of coronary heart disease and also dissociation with the birth weight. So famine is a, which we have forgotten often we think there is no, but once it happens, we need to look at it. There is impaired insulin secretion after prenatal exposure to the Dutch famine, which occurred. And what the conclusion was with this study that impaired glucose tolerance after exposure to famine during mid gestation and early gestation seems to be mediated through an insulin. Hello. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, sorry. Yes, Next slide, please. This is this is what I talked about the Dutch famine and then the historical cohort study. I'll I'll come to the last few slides now. Left. Next slide. Next. Oral talk. Yes. I was talking the genomic means of plasma glucose and insulin dotted concentration during the intravenous glucose test people who were exposed to famine. So famine, disaster, natural disaster, famine is one of the important component and those areas which tend to suffer, we have to look for these patients and try to re get uh, rescue them. Next one, malnutrition. We have heard it time and again, but, but this is the 2017 publication where the framework and epidemiological evidences have been collected and this is from the Russia, revealed that the exposure to famine in prenatal and early postnatal development is associated with increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes in adult life. And there is epigenetic regulation of gene activity, which is considered to be the main mechanism linking starvation in early life, increases of type 2 diabetes in adulthood. Next slide, please. 
This is the 2018 review also concluded that the famine has contributed China's current type 2 diabetes epidemic. So it's important. This is the Nature Review and Dr. Naji just published last year, 2019. And it has looked at the 217 meta analysis of the published Chinese all the literature. So famine has still relevance in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. Next slide, please. This is in relation to the epigenetics. And I'll go quickly now. Next slide. This is the relationship of the genome. And look at the, between the candidate gene. And I will be talking of P2, at least SIRT1, SNPs with prevalence of diabetes and BMI related. And what we understand now, why BMI is so important. And looking at the phenotype, at the background of these two, we can improve our clinical perception in diagnosing the prenatal exposure to the famine. And these patients who suffered with the famine, ultimately, there is a scientific explanation. Why do they get high type 2 diabetes? Next slide, please. This is, again, the genetic susceptibility. And there is, next slide, in adulthood. This is 2021 Diabetology publication. And this would, what you see, the genetic susceptibility and the risk of type 2 diabetes in the adulthood. Next slide. So nutrition is important and uh, we need to correct the nutrition and uh, with the childhood obesity also as well as during the famine and also looking at the type 1 diabetes. This is the association between, next slide, early life famine exposure and HOMA IR study and which have also substantiated that Famine is an important issue in development of the diabetes, and we have yet to answer these questions. War. We have a war. We have a war. We are have an Afghan war now at our head, and we have seen that during war time also, this is important because most of these patients would develop a lot of stress, the mental stress, the body stress, the scarvation of the food, and there's a scarcity of the food, and this would also lead to the new onset of diabetes. This is the US military service members relation to combat deployment and mental health. And during this, this is called post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. There's very high risk of the diabetes. This is the about, you look at the 2.07 in those patients who have a high stress after the war. This is the post-traumatic diabetes. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next one. Yes, next. Next one. So the post-traumatic diabetes and Graves disease are entities which are traditionally recognized by the physician in the compensation of personal injury. And how, according to the scientific literature, the role is still is to be assessed and we have to keep a very high index of suspicion. These are the sleep disturbances in chronic war-induced post-traumatic diabetes. And, and is an important issue during the type of pandemics. A and then next one, it is the depression, which had a poor glycemic control and patient with post-traumatic stress, diabetes and depression can be more and had a higher BMI than patient with neither diagnosis. Thus, male diabetes patients have a high post-traumatic stress diabetes. Next slide. These are the epigenetics biotypes in which stress plays an important role. And these are the computation analysis of DNA methylation profile identified by two PTSD biotypes and looking at a high risk and also have a polygenic risk scores and greater methylation compared to G1 biotype. What my purpose was that we have to cope with, this is the last slide, coping with matters which affect diabetic patient after disaster. Do not become panic. Gather a specific information. Patient with type 1 diabetes and insulin injection are indispensable and we have to arrange it, especially my patient who come from the western part of the Bihar, where flood last two, three months have been havoc. The flood has created havoc. It has also done havoc in the Mumbai, some part of the Gujarat also. And we need to provide health care to these patients. Need to keep your blood glucose level relatively high to avoid hypoglycemia. Provide enough glucose 
liquid and the prevent dehydration. And next slide now. Can I go to the next slide? Next slide. This is the Vivian Fonesca study, and which have shown the disparities and long-term consequences of trauma and also the condition which is related to the different studies in uh, New Orleans where the patient have shown in relation to the natural disaster. And, and we, we, we know that these is, uh, keep on coming. Next slide, next two slides, tsunami induced and Dr. Joshi wrote this. Next slide, next two slides, quickly two slides. These are the diaptic emergency kit. So to summarize my presentation, precision in medicine involves understanding of bioinformatics, pharmacogenetics, and advanced imaging technology. Management during disaster and pandemics require prompt execution. Next slide, please. Of healthcare facilities with limited resources to sick people on priority ground. Translation of advanced molecular biology into clinical skill is required to treat acute diabetic complication during disaster in deciding insulin or oral anti-glycemic drugs. In post-traumatic disaster stress, a new onset of diabetes required short in long-term planning for treatment and rehabilitation in physically and socially handicapped patient. I'm really sorry because of the, some technical issue. I couldn't keep a pace with the presentation. However, any suggestion, question, again, obliged to Banshee for giving me the opportunity and try to keep pace with the younger people. <laughs>